Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, how many of you are parents? Don't be shy. Get the hands up. Uh, teachers, professionals. Oh, so mostly parents. Uh, social workers. Uh, people who just came for the refreshment. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about myself. My job is to put people with disabilities to work. Not to get them jobs, but to get them jobs that they'll be able to keep. <laughs> Um, I like to say that getting, getting somebody a job is the easy part. Just like getting into college is the easier part of an education. It's staying in there. It's, it's having those skills and learning those skills to uh, make a big difference. A uh, good friend of mine, Steve Shore, who many of you know, Steve's on the uh, autism spectrum. And Steve used to say, if you meet one person with autism, you only meet one person with autism. And I used to agree with that, but over the years, I've learned that that's not quite the case, that there are certain commonalities, and there are areas that we've been able to locate both in terms of strengths and in terms of areas of deficit that, that share a commonality, and we can begin to develop tools to remediate that. And one of the biggest ones is soft skills, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. By the way, if you would like some more information, because I know 50 minutes isn't a whole lot of time, if you go to the Unicorn website, which is uh, unicornvillageacademy.com, um, I have a whole PowerPoint presentation on there um, illustrated by the Simpsons, my favorite dysfunctional family. Um, and it'll cover a lot of information. There's also a bunch of resources um, up on the website that, um, uh, that'll be helpful to you. So what I'm going to try to do in, in 15 minutes is review the current landscape for employment of, of folks with disabilities, to explore some of the promising uh, practices that integrate career communication and life skills assessment, and to talk about soft skills and how they make a huge difference, not only in the ability to get a job, but in the ability to keep that job and, and the differences between turning a job into what can potentially become a lifelong career. So let me kind of set the vision for you. And, and, and our vision is that the goal of transitional services is to help individuals with disabilities find and hold jobs, contribute to community life, and develop and maintain relationships through a variety of, of customized supports and accommodations. And that's kind of what we, what we try to do. Um, to, to put it more succinctly, what we want to do is help people function as independently as possible. We want to have them have satisfying social interactions. We want to prepare them to live and work in their community. And we want to put them on a path towards leading a productive, meaningful life that meets their expectations. So let me, let me give you the bad news first. The bad news is, and this is out of Cornell Research Study in, in 2011, which is the, the latest research, that 33% of working people between the ages of 21 and 64 with disabilities were employed. That's 33% out of 100%. Out of um, compared to a um, typical population, almost 76%. And, and that number is high because that's an employment number that's not a full-time employment number. So we've got best case in the world, a third of people only are working. Moreover, of those people who are working, 27.8% of them are living on the poverty level. So you know, that's kind of a real discouraging statistic, and those numbers really haven't changed in the last 35 years. So obviously we're doing something wrong. And one of the things we're doing wrong is we're making an assumption that work is work. And that if we're driving down the street and we're, uh, you know, a vocational rehab coach and we see that McDonald's has an opening, we grab the first client we have on our list and say, guess what, I got your job at McDonald's. And if it's a place where folks don't want to work, chances are that job isn't going to be really successful. And that's the typical way we, we approach things. The other thing that came out of the study was employers viewed soft skills. And the soft skills are basically the untangible ancillary skills that really make the difference between being a viable employee and being somebody who just shows up at work. Um, that employers felt that those were every bit as important as the academic skills that people had. And this is something that colleges and universities are beginning to take, take note of. 
the, the good news again is that we're living in a perfect economic storm in terms of the availability of jobs. There's a new awareness. We're looking at folks with disabilities with a totally different perspective. We're beginning to focus on people's strengths, not their, not their disabilities. Um, we have a, a very active community inclusion model going on. We're getting employees, uh, employers rather, beginning to buy in to the concept of hiring folks with disabilities, not because it's the right thing to do, not because it's nice, but because it really turns out to improve their bottom line dramatically. Um, we've begun to reduce the stigmata associated with folks with labels, and, and we're able to provide new training opportunities. So who's hiring right now? Well, again, the good news is that there are companies that specifically are going out and recruiting specific numbers of their, their employee, uh, employee population to be um, uh, cold for, for training within the organization. For example, um, one, one of the places we, we have locally, Walgreens. You know, Walgreens made a commitment that within the next five years, roughly 10 to 15 percent of all employees working for them are going to be folks with some kind of a disability. Uh, other companies that are hiring, the American Civil Liberties Union, Time Warner, Cummins Company, Starbucks, Home Depot, Lowe's, TRW, Capital One, Kraft Food, um, Dr. Pepper, Snapple, have all made those kinds of commitments. That's the good news. And, and what are the employers looking for? Well, they're looking for, and this is kind of what they call the universal hiring law. Any employer will hire an applicant as long as he or she believes it will bring in more profit than cost to their business. So it's all about that bottom line. If they can hire somebody who has the skill set that will help them generate revenue, won't drive away customers, and improve their bottom line, that consistently has been the number one criteria. Employees are looking for reliability and dependability. They're looking for availability and flexibility, productivity, good hygiene skills, and the number one thing they're looking for are social skills. The number 11th thing on the list that they're looking for are people who have the skill set to do the job because they feel that if the other things fall in place, they can train people properly the way they want. Disney has been doing that for years and years. Disney for years would hire right out of high school and through their management training program would hire from within. If they needed a lawyer, they would look for promising candidates, send them to school and have them get the training. And that model has worked consistently and more and more employers are beginning to do that. Give them good dependability, give them people with good hygiene and good social skills and they'll handle the actual job part. And it's a huge benefit to the employers. It's reduced rec uh, recruiting expenses, reduced training costs, reduced turnover, increases diversity for them. There are some tax credits available. And the bottom line is that losing people costs companies money. And if you ever placed an ad in the Sun Sentinel, and you know how much it costs to run a you know a one inch by, by one inch ad, um, if they can get people and get people to stay, that becomes a huge thing. So what the employers won't tell you in, in terms of why they shy away from hiring folks with disabilities, number one, they worry about the politics. The same way banks don't like to foreclose on churches and synagogues and schools, employers don't really want to be in a position of having to fire somebody who has, has a disability. Um, they worry about so-called perceived liability. Uh, when I was running the Summer Youth Employment Program for the Children's Services Council, my number one barrier when I would go to employers was, well, uh, our liability insurance is, is going to cost more, which isn't true. Nobody had ever bothered to check. It was just an assumption that people with disabilities are, are going to end up costing more money. Um, they worry about what their customers think. And again, having a good set of, of soft skills mitigates that. Because if the soft skills are there, you're not going to be able to spot folks quite that easily. And the last one is they worry about hidden costs. You know, is it going to cost them more for insurance and health benefits and, and those kind of costs? And one of the big movements that's happening now is a lot of companies are grabbing talented folks 
with disabilities and setting up their own employment companies where they'll go to employers and say, you know what, you hire these folks as um, 1099 consultant workers, we'll pay the insurance, we'll provide the transportation for them, and we'll help with, with the training part. And it's starting to make a huge difference, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about that as a trend because that solves the, the biggest stumbling blocks in the way. So what are these soft skills that I'm talking about? Well, they're the, they're the basic social and communication skills that you need to get a job, keep a job, and be a good employee. Things like developing a work ethic, feeling you're, like you're part of a team, communication skills related to the job, and being able to solve problems. Um, I have a cartoon that I'll pass around later. It says, a world without soft skills, and it's a restaurant, and a woman is sitting there talking on her cell phone, and she yells out to everybody else in the restaurant, excuse me, could everyone be quiet? I'm trying to talk on my cell phone. That's what a world without soft skills are. Um, the characteristics of, of the folks we're trying to employ, everybody's got their own stuff. My mother used to call it Michigas. You know, everybody's got that little quirkiness. And if that quirkiness can kind of fit in and, and take the form of a uniqueness as opposed to taking the form of, I have to stay away from that person, they don't communicate, there's something strange about them. That can be the difference. And that's where the soft skills training can come in dramatically. Um, the soft skills revolve around the set of what we commonly have called in the past life skills. And those include our communication skills, our daily living skills, our work study skills, our home life, self-care, the ability to have social relationships, housing and money management. Um, essentially, what we need to feel secure is, you know, reduce stress and anxiety. That's a really important piece. We need to feel safe. We need to feel valued, we need to have social acceptance, we need to have career options, and we need to be happy. And you know what? That's not just folks with disability, that's all of us, and that's where that commonality comes. So the difference is that those soft skills that come naturally to us really have to be broken down and taught. And there are now more and more emerging curriculums. We're developing one now at Unicorn that actually is placing kids from the time they're 16 out in the community on internships so that they can pick up some of these skills, so that they can become used to talking to people, getting involved with people, um, understanding sarcasm, understanding humor. So the soft skills basically, there are two kinds of them. They're the broad area skills and then there's the sp specific skills. The broad area skills are things like the ability to network, the ability to show you're enthusiastic, um, the ability to develop so-called professionalism uh, skills, communication skills, probably the most important of all, teamwork. To feel like you're part of a team and for the employer to feel like you're a loyal member of a team. And, and the second most important, problem solving and, and critical thinking skills. The more localized skills are things like having a positive attitude, coming to work feeling like, you know, this is my career, this is my place to go. Uh, being able to talk to other people in a meaningful conversation, listening skills, getting along with others, managing your time on the job, um, showing respect, being a team player, and being confident and comfortable in what you do. Um, things like being able to say to a customer, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Those things can make a dramatic difference, and again, those don't come naturally to a lot of the folks that we're working with. Those skill sets have to be taught. Um, I'll give you an idea of some of the um, ways that these skills can be taught. So how do we get the soft skills? Well, one way is obviously, of course, through, through training <coughs> in, in soft skill class development. Um, they have different names. Some people call them soft skill <laughs> pragmatics. Some people label them under, under social pragmatics. They're being taught through programs like Mike's. They're being taught through programs like mine on the high school level. The realization of how do you get folks kind of to be included. You know, any boss will tolerate more if it's somebody that they like and somebody that they feel is, is part of the team. And a lot of our kids, because they've never had that, those socialization opportunities, always tend to be more isolated, tend to be aloof. And you can spot them in a crowd. 
And you know, my goal is that you can't spun them in a crowd, that you can't tell the folks with the disability from the typical person. So how do you get these? Well, one is programs like mentoring programs, whether on the high school level or on the college level. Another one is to have folks join dramatics classes, theater groups, music clubs, and related kinds of activities. To volunteer, to have somebody go out in the community and volunteer in an area of their interest. Again, this is another common mistake. You know, we put people out of employment without spending a lot of time helping them to determine what they really want to do and then giving them some of those prerequisite skills so that, that they're headed for success. Um, allow them to take classes of interest, uh, adult ed classes, continuing ed classes, entry-level college classes, um, attending community lectures, visiting career centers, and probably the most important of all is role-playing going through a variety of scenarios and different kinds of experiences so that people have the mechanism to reduce the stress and anxiety. I know there's not a lot of dramatic research out there, but I, my theory has always been if you can figure out how to reduce that area of stress and anxiety, that will make all the difference for lots and lots of people. So I'll be around if you have any other questions. Um, also, if you go to the website, there's a bunch of resources. The Corn Cornell is a great resource to check on, on what's going on, and there's a bunch of other resources on developing the social skills and the whole area of soft skills. <clears throat> Five years ago, nobody knew what we were talking about. Now it's becoming very important. Thank you.